During the Last Supper, Jesus took a towel and washed his disciples' feet. He then told them, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Should we interpret Jesus' command literally by washing each other's feet? Or did he just mean we should look for ways to serve our fellow believers? Stay tuned to hear Dr. David K. Bernard's response. Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, a podcast dedicated to helping modern-day believers live out the teachings of the first century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. Thank you for joining us for this episode. In a podcast episode earlier this year, you addressed the subject of communion, which prompted some listeners to ask about the subject of foot washing. The United Pentecostal Church International's Articles of Faith does include a section about foot washing, and it references John 13, which gives us the account, of course, of Jesus washing his disciples' feet at the Last Supper. And in that that chapter, John 13, Jesus says, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. That's verses 14 and 15 from that chapter. Should we interpret Jesus' command literally that and, and literally wash one another's feet, or did he just mean that we should look for ways that we can serve one another? Is foot washing what you do you see it as a scriptural requirement? I would say that foot washing is a scriptural teaching. Now, requirement is a strong word. I would prefer to say it, it is a scriptural teaching. I think we should practice foot washing. Now, some people think it's symbolic only, but you know, we Pentecostals generally, our approach is to take the scripture as literally as possible. So obviously some things are symbols, some things relate to first century culture, uh, or some things of the Old Testament typologies. So, so we understand that some things aren't duplicated in a literal sense, but overall, especially the teachings of the New Testament, if they can be applied in actuality, we tend to say, let's do it. That way. So we baptize in water, literally. We anoint with oil, literally. We lay hands on the sick, literally. And where there are other groups that symbolize all those things, say it's figurative. You don't actually do that, you know. We tend to say, well, if it says to do it, and if you can do it, it's possible and it's available, then go ahead and do it. So on that basis, I would say yes. Uh, now, uh, where I would say, you know, instead of requirement, it's a teaching, is that you only have one clear statement here. So there could, I understand there could be some dispute. It, although in 1 Timothy, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about the widows that you would support, the church should support, it should be those who've washed the saints' feet. So whether that means a practice of the church, they're faithful in church, they're, they're participating in all the activities of the church, or whether it's talking about a secular uh, counterpart, I guess that also is subject to dispute. And I, and I guess also maybe part of the problem is in the first century, people wore sandals when they came into the house, they would need to take their sandals off. The, the roads were dusty. And so normally a servant would wash their feet. That was the first thing. And so that was a cultural norm in a way that it's not today. So some people say, well, it's just the principle. So learn to serve others, learn to do things for others. Uh, But, you know, you do have a very specific statement. I did this and I want you to do this. And it is, I I guess, whether you think it's literal or symbolic, um, let's ask, what's the purpose? Uh, It seems obvious it's designed to teach humility that Jesus, I'm, I'm your leader, I'm your Lord but yet I will humble myself to wash your feet. So how much more should you be humble towards one another? I think it definitely teaches humility not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It also teaches service, that we should serve one another. No matter who we may be and whatever our position is in the church or in society, we're all to serve one another. And I do think it's interesting throughout history, various churches have tried to implement this. So what's interesting is that in the uh, more liturgical churches or historical churches, 
like the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and so forth, they don't participate as a congregation, probably because it's no longer a cultural norm, but their leaders will do it. So the Pope, once a year, will choose a beggar and wash feet. And the other denominations, a lot of times their top leaders, their bishops, will will once a year or certain intervals will wash a humble person's feet. So they do feel the need to to do this, you know, and and to do it literally. Of course, if it's a high official washing a, a lowly person's feet once a year, it's that almost is taking pride in your humility, you know. You know the saying is humility is that one virtue that just when you think you have it, you've lost it, you know. I'm, I'm proud of being humble. <laughs> well, you're not humble. So I guess humility is, is what you have when you don't really think about it. You, you're not, you don't really think you have it is when you have it. So that symbolic performance almost turns it on its head. It, you're, you're showing how great of a Christian you are or how great of a leader you are, which is not really the point. Now, among revival churches, it's interesting throughout the centuries, like the Anabaptists of the 1500s and the whole, the Methodists, some of the Methodists, the Holiness Movement of the 1900s, the, the Pentecost Movement of the, of the 20th century, uh, the Holiness Movement of the 1800s. Uh, m- many of those congregations would actually, as a congregation, institute the practice of foot washing. Say, whenever they did communion, or maybe once a year, or maybe at a watch night service. So, it, to me, it is significant. Uh, that many of the more conservative, literal, Bible-believing, revivalistic movements that are deliberately saying, let's go back to the Bible and recapture what's been lost or missing or neglected, well, they would literally wash feet. So in the early Pentecostal movement, it's very common, and that's why it's in the UPCI Articles of Faith. I think that was considered the standard for most churches at the time Uh, of the formation of the UPCI in 1945, it was the most common expectation. Yes, just as you would literally practice communion, you would literally practice foot washing. I will have to say I do believe it's diminished greatly, and I'm a little saddened by that. Um, There is a great book by John Christopher Thomas, who's a Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee uh, theologian, uh, it's called, I, uh, I can't remember the total title, but it has foot washing the title. John Christopher Thomas foot washing is a great biblical study of why, yes, it should be practiced today. So when I was a pastor, we did practice it once a year. Uh, when we were smaller, we would have a watch night service. We'd have communion and foot washing on December 31st. We had more extended time. But as the church got big, it became difficult. What we would do is I would take uh, usually in February, uh, towards the beginning of the year, one midweek service, I would announce in advance, but the men would all meet for a class and I would address some issues that I felt were pertinent to men. The women would go to the fellowship hall for foot washing. And then the next week we would reverse it and the men would have foot washing. And what we would do is we, of course, it was mostly symbolic in the sense, you know, you want to come to church clean, but but you take somebody, you have pans of water, and you wash someone's feet. As you're washing, you pray for them. And then when you finish, they wash your feet. So it's mutual submission. You pray for one another. And then when you finish, you find other people to pray for. So it becomes a brotherhood. It becomes a prayer service. And I would usually teach a little bit on the significance. Then we would participate, and then we would pray. So it would take the bulk of the service. And, you know, I've been in, in services where there have been powerful moves of God. And, in fact, we I remember one time we had a, someone receive the Holy Ghost in the foot washing service because it was taught and practiced as a spiritual event. Um, yes, it is a little humbling and humiliating, but here's my thought, final thought on it, whether it should be symbolic or literal. Uh, I tend to say, yes, it should be done literally. And I, I do understand, even though it's not a cultural norm, it's still, still to wash someone's feet is a humbling experience. And so probably, whereas if you substitute, well, let's, let's shine their shoes or let's wash their car, it's not the same level of humility. So is there really a good substitute? And probably my final thought would be this. Probably if you list the reasons why you don't want to do it, that's probably the reasons why you should do it. So I, you know, obviously we respect local pastors and the choices they make for their congregation. But since you're asking me, 
I feel like it is a biblical practice, and I feel like it is a practice that's worth preserving in the Pentecostal movement. Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share Apostolic Life in the 21st Century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.